Nick Majerison here. Welcome to Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading the podcast. If you're enjoying what you hear, do make sure you've subscribed. This week, we're presenting to you our Extreme Everest mini-series. Today's presentation is Richard Moon, Therapeutic Hyperoxia, Medicine Under Pressure. Have a listen. Top Med Talk. Good. It's great to see the team here at Duke. I'm going to flip the oxygen seesaw in the opposite direction and talk about hyperoxia, extreme hyperoxia. I don't have any disclosures relevant to this talk, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of hyperbaric oxygen, the physiology, and then therapy that is for selected indications, just to give you a flavor of what it's all about. And finally, talk about oxygen toxicity. So hyperbaric oxygen is defined as administration of 100% oxygen at greater than 1.4 atmospheres absolute. Typical treatment regimen is 90 to 120 minutes at two to three atmospheres, two to three times, per, one to three times per day. This is what we do therapeutically. There's no hip issue here. These are all faked except for the baby, and I don't think anybody recognizes the baby. But oxygen is administered in two types of chambers. One is a multi-place chamber, which is compressed with air, and you have oxygen delivered by a head tent, such as in the upper left and the or endotracheal tube, lower left, or in a monoplace chamber in which the entire volume is filled with 100% oxygen. So what happens under these conditions? And what you see here are the results from an experiment we did some years ago to look at nitric oxide function under hypoxic conditions, normoxia and, and hyperoxia. So on the left, you see uh, blood gases. So under hypoxic conditions, the arterial and mixed venous PO2s are respectively about 40 and, and 30. Under normoxic conditions, the usual 100 millimeters of mercury arterial and, and roughly 40 millimeters of mercury in the mixed venous. And under at three atmospheres, the arterial PO2 was about 1,400, and the mixed venous was about 400. So the entire blood system is fully saturated with oxygen, and the organism is basically living off the dissolved fraction. Now, on the upper right, you can see the cardiac output tends to go up with hypoxia, down with hyperoxia. The hyperoxic effect seems to be a baroreceptor effect. So what happens is when you breathe hyperbaric oxygen, you get increased reactive oxygen species that then consume nitric oxide, which is, of course, a vasodilator. And so if you have less vasodilatation around, you get, therefore, vasoconstriction. Blood pressure goes up, heart rate goes down by virtue of the baroreceptor reflex, and, and cardiac output goes down as well. And then at the lower right, you see the effects on pulmonary vascular resistance in blue. It goes up with hypoxia and down with hyperoxia. And systemic vascular resistance goes in the opposite direction. It goes up with hyperoxia, so you get vasoconstriction. So that's basically the physiology. The history actually dates back to the 19th century when compressed air work was first designed in Belgium for use in mines. If you're digging a mine through essentially quicksand, you have to hyperbaricize the environment, compress the environment to keep out the water. And this is the first compressed air project in the United States. It was the bridge across the Mississippi at St. Louis, where the environment where the men were working, basically in quicksand, you can see that the surface of the water, and then the next line down is the, the bottom of the river, but from there down to bedrock is another four or five fold depth in which it would be impossible to build a bridge in the usual fashion. Basically what you do normally, you put a cylinder on the bottom of the river, you pump out the water and guys go down and dig and build the bridge tower. So this device on the right, the bridge tower, underneath of which is a compressed air environment, men would work down there at a pressure that reached the equivalent depth of about 130 feet and at the end of the shift, it's Miller time, so they would instantaneously decompress, climb up the 10 to 13 stories to the top, and then go and have some refreshment. But many men died. There were 14 known deaths at that time and numerous cases of decompression sickness. On the right, you can see a photograph of the construction. Well, what happens when you decompress is you can get in situ bubble formation due to nitrogen coming out of solution on the left. Everyone I know in the hyperbaric business has a copy of this particular 
rat experiment that was done back in the 1970s. And the other thing that can happen, not so much in compressed air workers, but in divers, if they ascend while holding their breath or there's local lung pathology causing gas trapping, the alveoli can rupture injecting air into the arterial blood. Now, what do you do when that happens? It was found back in the 19th century that if you recompress men with this situation that they would often feel better. And then in the 1930s, Yarbrough and Benke, who were U.S. Naval medical officers, discovered that oxygen recompression was more effective. And the reason is that if you have a bubble in your tissues, then on the far right of the upper left-hand quadrant, you can see the gas pressures inside a nitrogen bubble and the bubble is made up of yellow, mostly nitrogen, with a little bit of water vapor. And the next bar graph over leftward are the gas pressures in the tissue, which are mostly nitrogen, but some oxygen. There's some CO2 and water vapor. But if you do the calculations, you find that there's a gradient in favor of diffusion of gas out of the bubble into the tissue of about 140 millimeters of mercury. And this is why bubbles don't last forever in tissues. If you breathe oxygen, lower left, the nitrogen in the tissue is washed out and the gradient for diffusion increases several fold to over 700 millimeters of mercury. And lower right, if you breathe hyperbaric oxygen at 2.8 atmospheres, which is the usual treatment pressure for this condition, you increase the gradient to over 2,000 millimeters of mercury. So the hyperbaric oxygen is the right treatment for bubbles. Now it's a very rewarding disease to treat. On the left is a guy who had gone on holiday from the Austrian Alps to the Caribbean and made a couple of dives, came to the surface, was paralyzed, made the mistake of going back down again. But of course, when you do that, what's your next trick? Because eventually you run out of air and he came to the surface, was profoundly weak in his legs, was flown to us. And you can see he's quite depressed. His wife was there trying to comfort him. He couldn't move his legs. And after several treatments and some rehab, he was able to do jumping jacks and all kinds of things. He wasn't quite normal. He had some urinary retention, but at least he could walk. And there are no randomized trials of hyperbaric oxygen for this condition, but meta-analyses, case series, this is one that was done by Drew Dutka several years ago, looking at gas embolism, iatrogenic gas embolism, and use of hyperbaric oxygen versus no recompression resulted in greater numbers of full recovery and fewer deaths. So I'll present another case of a condition which is somewhat rare, but quite disturbing when it happens. Usually it occurs in the presence of intestinal disease. In this case, the patient had dermatomyositis and came to us with this condition, pneumatosis intestinalis. She had ileus, swelling of her abdomen, and had been treated conservatively for several days and eventually they called us and asked if we might be able to help. On the left you can see your abdomen is distended with a tremendous amount of gas in the wall of the bowel. We treated her a few times and her abdomen became less distended. The gas was largely resolved and she went home. Now another condition for which hyperbaric oxygen is useful is carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide is produced by all combustion House fires are one example. Back in the days before catalytic converters, spending you know, some quality time in the car with the engine running in the winter was another cause. Nowadays, uh, cars don't make too much carbon monoxide, so we don't see this much anymore. But industrial workers working with propane-powered forklift trucks, uh, people who barbecue inside the kitchen when it's raining outside, we do see a few of these. Methylene chloride, which is a largely disused paint stripper, but occasionally you see this, the liver itself metabolizes methylene chloride to carbon monoxide. So if you inhale fumes of this compound, you can get poisoned by carbon monoxide. Now, carbon monoxide does several things. It combines with hemoglobin to form carboxyhemoglobin, and this does not carry oxygen. So there's an acute anemia, if you like, Associated with this is a change in the oxyhemoglobin characteristics. There's a shift to the left. The remaining hemoglobin binds oxygen more avidly, and therefore uh, the PO2 at which it releases oxygen has to be lower. So these two effects cause tissue hypoxia. Carbon monoxide also binds to several hemoproteins, such as cytochrome AA3. It blocks the electron transport chain, just as cyanide does causing excess electrons to be released further up the chain, 
And these electrons cause mischief by combining with oxygen, for example, to form superoxide, which then has secondary effects on lipid peroxidation and other phenomena. It also, by the way, stimulates guanylate cyclase, which then accelerates the formation of cyclic GMP, which is a vasodilator. So in this way, carbon monoxide acts like nitric oxide, and this is believed to be one of the reasons why patients with carbon monoxide poisoning have headache. They get extracranial vasodilatation. It's a migraine-like phenomenon. Now, what about oxygen in all of this? In 1950, Dr. Pace published a paper in Science showing that the half-life of carboxyhemoglobin was reduced when oxygen was given at one atmosphere or even further reduced with hyperbaric oxygen. In the lower right, you can see a, a whole series of individual observations of carboxyhemoglobin half-life at various oxygen tensions. And the point here is that as PO2 goes up, carboxyhemoglobin half-time goes down. And up in the hyperbaric range, it's down around 20 minutes. So you can get rid of the stuff more quickly. Now, this is fine, but the point I want to make here is that carboxyhemoglobin, which is the way you make the diagnosis, is not the whole story. And we've seen several cases of people who've been treated with oxygen arrived in our doorstep profoundly abnormal neurologically, who then get better with hyperbaric oxygen. Now, a number of clinical trials have been done over the years. The green ones represent the ones that have been positive. The blue ones were not positive, so I'll talk about the positive ones first. So Ducasse in France, Steve Thom in Philadelphia, Mathieu in, in Lille, France, actually he's got the largest study, showed that hyperbaric oxygen has improved outcome at three months, not quite significant at one year. And then Lynn Weaver from Salt Lake City did arguably the most detailed hyperbaric oxygen study where he had 98% follow-up at one month and 84% at one year with neuropsych testing and showed that in the hyperbaric group versus the control group, the outcome was significantly better. The Raphael study in France was not positive, partly because the group who did not lose consciousness, he did indeed compare hyperbaric oxygen versus normobaric oxygen, but in this group, one would expect an attenuated effect. In other words, these are less severely poisoned. Since he believed in hyperbaric oxygen, he didn't feel that he could actually ethically, in those who had lost consciousness, compare hyperbaric oxygen versus normobaric oxygen. So he compared one versus two hyperbaric oxygen treatments and didn't find a difference. So arguably, he didn't really do the experiment that was wanted. Scheinkessel in Australia had a negative study but his control group was something that I don't think anyone else in the world does. He kept people in hospital for three whole days, breathing high flow oxygen. And most of us feel like we can more efficiently get people back home with, with hyperbaric oxygen. And then Anand, again in France, uh, had a negative study again with no loss of consciousness. So I think the, the weight of evidence is that hyperbaric oxygen is effective for acute carbon monoxide poisoning. And this shows you Lynn Weaver's study. This is cognitive sequelae versus time to treatment and treatment. So the, the blue are the control patients and the green are the, the hyperbaric oxygen treated. And, and even at one year, there was a, a difference in outcome. So who to treat, uh, history of neurological event or certainly an abnormal uh, neurological exam, cardiac dysfunction, pregnancy with evidence of fetal distress, uh, such as fetal tachycardia or just as a marker of severity of exposure, carboxyhemoglobin greater than 25%. Now, along with other indications for hyperbaric oxygen came a group from Holland who, in the 1960s and 70s, started studying gas gangrene and necrotizing fasciitis. Holland, uh, Holland being a agrarian country, a lot of farm animals, a lot of bicycles, there are a lot of bicycle versus car accidents, a lot of clostridial spores in the soil, and they had large numbers of gas gangrene. This is actually a case we treated some years ago. This is a gentleman who fell off his motorcycle in rural North Carolina. He was patched up in the emergency room, sent home with some analgesics, but they had failed to detect a small puncture wound here in which some dirt had been inserted during the accident. And several hours later, he came back to the emergency room in excruciating pain. An x-ray revealed gas, and then the gram stain showed typical clostridial Gram-Hauser rod. On the bottom, you see a gentleman with a much more insidious disease, a much more indolent, I should say, disease, where he had a perirectal abscess, he was diabetic, failed to do anything about it until he was taken to the emergency room, deathly ill, 
and at the, t at the time of surgery had fasciitis extending all the way up to his upper abdominal wall. And this condition is usually a mixed infection. You can see various gram-positive and gram-negative gram organisms. Usually there's at least one aerobe and one anaerobe and, and often several species. This, if you ever see this condition, it's highly lethal. This is Clostridium septicum. This is a man who was minding his own business. When he was shaving in the morning, felt a little pain in his chest. By the time he'd had breakfast, he was feeling very ill, went to the emergency room, and ultimately, very quickly, went to the operating room where they debrided his chest. And his gram stain showed the same thing. This was Clostridium septicum. Ultimately, he died. If you ever see this, it's, there's almost invariably bowel pathology. So these patients have either bowel cancer or in inflammatory bowel disease. This organism lives in the bowel and it gets access to the circulation through defect in the bowel wall. And that's why often these people have nothing, no obvious predisposing condition that just shows up. Now, this is a rare condition now, and we certainly don't have any randomized controlled trials except in volunteer mice. And what you see here, is a study from the 1970s, actually from Duke, where they had a model of gas gangrene in mice by injecting norepinephrine and clostridia into the hind limbs. The top group show significant loss of limb. You can also notice that they're very scrawny, horrible looking animals, whereas the ones who got hyperbaric oxygen are nice, fluffy, and much healthier looking. And also the limb loss is significantly different. Now, what about humans? One of the surgeons and I discussed actually doing a randomized study some years ago, and we realized that the power analysis meant that we'd have to be studying for about 20 or 30 years before we would have enough subjects to come to any conclusion, and neither one of us was willing to commit to that. So Rick So from Singapore and we collaborated uh, to look at the National Inpatient Sample Database and found a number of individuals with necrotizing infections, which included Clostridia, some of whom had gotten hyperbaric oxygen, some of whom had not. And using the best matching that we could, looked at in-hospital mortality, complications, shock, severe sepsis, and acute organ dysfunction, and found an improvement or lower risk of these complications in those who got hyperbaric oxygen. Now, it's obviously not a perfect study because you don't really know whether perhaps those hospitals who had hyperbaric chambers might have had more skilled surgeons and intensivists and what have you, but that's the best we have. Now, a, an experimental treatment that we're working on now is after lung transplant, because the bronchial circulation is interrupted, the anastomosis is at risk for ischemia, and some people indeed develop these necrotic areas with pseudomembranes. And we're doing a, a randomized study of hyperbaric oxygen versus not in this group, and this is one patient where there was significant improvement. This is a slow process. These people don't come along every day. But this paper was published really to demonstrate safety rather than efficacy. There's not, there aren't enough uh, patients here to prove that it's effective, so we're still waiting on that. Now, of course, no treatment in medicine is entirely safe, and it, this includes hyperbaric oxygen, which of course is toxic not only to the lung but other organs as well. And the brain is affected, if I can get this to work. Now, let's observe the effect of breathing air in which the partial pressure of oxygen is considerably higher than normal. The individual on whom this demonstration is being performed has agreed to this exposure. So this is breathing at four atmospheres absolute, 100% oxygen, which we would never do today. And after 15 minutes, you'll see that he, he's starting to flutter his eyelids. He's hyperventilating, and within a few seconds, he's in a generalized tonic-clonic convulsion. Muscular twitching, such as in the eyes and hands. This soon becomes generalized. Finally, the victim becomes convulsive, a condition which, if it occurs underwater, is almost certain to end fatally. Yeah, this was actually discovered in World War II when various navies were interested in special forces divers to sneak into enemy harbors and plant explosives on ships. Of course, if you don't want bubbles to give your position away to the bad guys, you have to have a closed circuit rebreather which at that time only consisted of 100% oxygen. So these guys 
were trying this out at various depths, and it was found that some of them didn't come back if they went too deep, and eventually it was worked out that it was due to convulsions in the water. So just to summarize, some acute indications for hyperbaric oxygen include bubble disease, decompression illness, uh, arterial gas embolism, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, and necrotizing fasciitis, or clostridial infection that we've already talked about, and then certain other situations such as crush injury where the edema can be reduced and, and the tissue more efficiently oxygenated. And then central retinal artery occlusion, which is an uncommon condition, but obviously is associated with blindness, acute sensory neural hearing loss, and then certain compromised skin flaps and grafts. And we usually get phone calls post-op from the plastic surgeons on this. And then there's some investigational issues such as anastomotic ischemia after lung transplant and pneumatosis. So I'm going to stop there. Please fire away if you have any questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Richard. Don't forget you can meet the Top Med Talk team at pom.org forward slash meetings. Our next big event takes place between the 28th and the 30th of September. EdPOM USA Chicago Masters course a perioperative care practicum.